Hello, everyone. Um, I would just start off by saying the reason that we have to talk title that we do is really to acknowledge uh, there's very different resources, the northern and southern high plains, the interaction of surface water with groundwater, and how the resources actually drive the management that goes on in the various areas. I'll talk a little bit later on about how stream flow triggers in the northern high plains where groundwater is most abundant um, doesn't necessarily mean you have a ton of surface water even though you have abundant groundwater. Um, so for overview, I'm going to start off talking about our groundwater resources program and these regional studies which we're conducting across the United States. Um, then I'm going to talk about characteristics of the Northern High Plains Aquifer, uh, the model, and our assessment of future water availability and how those stream flow trigger, triggers are driving the integrated management. As I mentioned, uh, we do these studies, regional studies of principal aquifers across the United States. And you can see in gold many of the studies that are already completed or nearly completed, um, and it's many of the principal aquifers, again, across the United States, um, from California all the way to the East Coast. Uh, the glacial aquifer is shown by the, uh, the uh, crosshatch lines there. So um, these studies are rolled up every five years or so and reported to Congress for uh, reports about our nation's water availability, but they're also meant to provide foundation for local uh, stakeholders' uh, assessments of water resources. High Plains Aquifer uh, accounts for about 30 percent of groundwater withdrawn for irrigation in the United States, in addition to that agricultural production. Obviously, um, there's a lot going on at the scale of the High Plains um, and well known for those groundwater withdrawals. Our plan of study, just to tell you about how we attacked this, uh, was that Within the uh, time and resources that we had to complete the study, we could not complete new models of all portions of the aquifer. Um, so we selected the Northern High Plains Aquifer to do a new groundwater flow model. And then we provided estimates of selected water budget components for the entire High Plains Aquifer. Um, this is uh, just a cover shot of the report, the first report that came out of the study, which is estimates of those selected water budget components for the 1940s and the 2000s. Um, and before I forget to say this, I have a few printed copies of the report along with me today. If somebody wants one and doesn't have one yet, uh, let me know and you know, or get with me after this talk. Um, I'll show you a few selected outputs for this. But uh, just to start off and say, of course, it is at the scale of the entire High Plains Aquifer. It is compiled a uh, compilation of previous estimates of water budget components as well as for some components then we generated new estimates of those components. Uh, these are not judgments or endorsements of the particular techniques but just comparisons of the, of the things that you get or the various estimates and how they compare at the scale of the aquifer. Um, here is one example. This is from one estimate of recharge that we provided. Um, at the scale of the aquifer again. And for the 2000s, patterns of recharge estimated with a daily soil water balance model. Um, and so you can see the darker colors of green showing higher rates of recharge, uh, you know, 8 or 10 inches per year, and the lighter colors go down to 0 or, you know, a tenth of an inch per year, which is more prevalent in the western and in parts of the southern high plains. Um, Here's some comparisons of what you get for the various water budget components if you look at all of them, the range of those values uh, for the various, for the couple of decades. So for the 1940s, uh, these are units of millions of acre feet per year. Uh, the precipitation falling on land surface estimates range from 192 to 199, so that's the big number. Um, smaller numbers, the recharge from precipitation that actually reaches the water table is only a small percentage of that at 8 to 13.2 million acre feet per year. Surface runoff leaving the high plains, again a small number, 1.9 million acre feet per year. Uh, maximum ET from shallow groundwater at 9 million acre feet per year. Uh, net groundwater discharge to streams leaving the high plains at 3.1 million acre feet per year. And so um, you can see, you know, there's some of these things that are very big numbers, but the parts that relate specifically to groundwater then are smaller parts of that, of those uh, bigger inflows. If you look at the differences in the 2000s, we have estimates of groundwater pumpage shown here in the middle of the screen, uh, ranging from 8.7 to 19 million acre feet per year. One of the particular models that was summarized 
um, one of the particular uh, irrigation estimation models that summarized here uh, was built for a much more humid area and it estimated huge volumes of irrigation for this area that, that weren't accurate, but that's why it goes up to 19. In any case, uh, maximum ET from shallow groundwater a little bit higher than what we showed for the 1940s. Um, net groundwater discharge to streams leaving the high plains also higher than it was for the 1940s. Um, and then we also see this reduction of groundwater in storage. And again, that's at the scale of the entire aquifer. Um, so um, one of the second things that came out of our study was a compilation of not only those water budget component estimates, but also of other data relevant to the framework of the High Plains Aquifer. This contains, um, for the entire northern High Plains, test hole data from the various states and databases aggregated into one uniform database. Um, it contains the other stuff from the water budget report, base flow estimates from the northern High Plains, and a variety of the other geospatial data that's just made readily available. And so again, this is a, a foundation piece for all future studies as well as just making everything that we use uh, for the study more readily available. I'll say a little bit more about the soil water balance model that we used for this study. It is a daily soil water balance model, but it operates on readily available climatic and physical data. Soils, land covers, elevations, uh, climatic data at weather stations or from mapping techniques. Um, and basically, the code that we use for the modeling for the, that I'll talk about for the rest of this study uh, is a, a more refined version of what was presented in our water budget report or what we use for our water budget report um, that does a better job of accounting for irrigation water withdrawals, the fate of that water as it impacts recharge. Um, and so that model that we used for the water budget report then covered only the 1940s and 2000s, and so we expanded to cover the entire range uh, for the groundwater flow modeling. And so here's just an average of groundwater recharge estimated with that model uh, for the entire 1940 through 2009 period. Um, you can see the influence of irrigated lands in this little bit of tan color here. Um, you can see the influence of climate as you go across the sand hills from west to east, you see more and more recharge occurring. Um, and here in the southwest, we heard earlier today, it's much more arid and you see very low rates of recharge down to an approaching a tenth of an inch per year. Um, so for the groundwater flow model, we used all the available data that we could get in order to calibrate it. And what that amounts to for the 1940 through 2009 period, we used about 335,000 water level measurements from spring and fall water levels. Um, we used about 8,000 water levels for pre-development. Um, for the stream base flows at 91 different gauges, about 11,000 measurements, uh, estimates. Obviously, there's continuous data at stream gauges, but we selected spring and fall estimates again. And then pre-development base flow for 25 major gauges. Here's what this looks like temporally if you look at through the scale of time. Obviously, early on in the northern high plains, very few measurements, um, you know, less than 500 per season. Later on, we have over 40, you know, 4,000 per season, so much more data available. If you look at this on a map, primarily in 1940, um, you have a lot of measurements near the Platte River. You have some spread out across Nebraska, very little in other areas. Um, in 2008, obviously, we have a much more complete coverage and much more extensive coverage that uh, does a better job of showing us what all the water levels were. And here's the locations of those stream gauges that we use for, for calibrating the model. So the calibration approach was to use parameter estimation through the PEST suite of software. We have over 1,300 parameters that we use to calibrate the model. Um, which uh, relate to temporal and spatial changes in recharge, hydraulic connectivity of the aquifer system, hydraulic connectivity of the stream beds across the aquifer system. And we use about 25 programs of 10 batch files, and a lot of them are set up to run in automated fashion in order to accomplish this parameter estimation with this large model. Um, and we've been using about 65 cores in parallel to solve the parameter estimation problem. Uh, some considerations. 
The size of this area means we are beyond the capabilities of commercial GUIs gu and you know things that are off the shelf. We have to design brand new programs to interface with a model of this size and be able to do this work. Um, so a lot of this is you know hand programmed or you know right uh, to interact directly with Modflow. We do have a lot of benefits from previous and ongoing studies, especially in Nebraska. Uh, as Jesse talked about, there was you know, a lot of geophysical data that's been collected and some of that from the western part of the state that was published, we've incorporated into this model. Um, and so we have benefits of a lot of studies that have gone on across Nebraska and in these areas that fed into our High Plains study. Um, I also say that we brought a lot of national expertise to bear on this problem. We have a lot of national research program, research hydrologists, who have come to Nebraska or work with us on this, you know, northern high plains problem in order to, uh, to come up with the, the answers. So the model calibration is nearly complete pending review. I'm going to show you some of those outputs in a minute. We are writing the report right now, and then we're going to get into the analysis of water availability in that final report. And I'll show you some highlights of what that's going to be about in a minute. Um, so, just sort of in the aggregate at the scale of the aquifer across those 335,000 measurements we have a mean residual or the difference between our simulated estimated groundwater levels of less than two feet. Um, so this is very good. Um, the simulated and estimated stream flows have a, a difference of about 14 CFS cubic feet per second and I'll show you some charts of what that looks like in a minute. Um, here's an example of a water level residual map for the 1950s. Um, and I wouldn't worry about reading all of the legend, but other than to say the ones that are gray are what are our simulated water levels are pretty close to what was measured in the wells in the, in the area. Uh, reds is where simulated are too low and blues is where simulated is too high. Um, and so the main point to show here is that across the scale of this aquifer, mostly we're seeing grays. We've got the regional water level picture about right. Um, for the 2000s, a similar thing. Again, there's some other colors mixed in with the grays, but if you look broad brush across the entire scale of the aquifer, most of the areas are shown grays. You have some other things mixed in at smaller scales, but again, we've mostly captured those regional water levels of the aquifer. I'll show you some uh, simulated stream flow, um, and this will be for the Niobrara River Basin. There's a gauge here for the Niobrara, and then right here for Plum Creek at Meadville this small tributary. Um, and so what you see here, the Niobrara River at Norton, there's some noise later on in the record that causes the base flow estimates to jump up and down. It's caused by reservoir operations. Uh, but nonetheless, the model simulates this pre-reservoir section. We're in the same range as those estimated base flow values, and it continues on through the middle of this range of uh, reservoir affected operations. Plum Creek at Meadville, that very small tributary, much different size, it actually has a temporal trend as well that the model does reproduce. We start at uh, under 100 CFS of stream base flow and then it increases through time to over 100 CFS. Uh, again, the blues are, are our estimated base flows, reds are what the model did, and mostly you see they're in the same place. There's a few uh, high flows near the end of the time that are in the stream base flow estimate. Um, and but the model is you know really right in sync with the rest of this. I'm showing you for the Elkhorn River at Norfolk, and uh, basically here you see about the same thing again. There's some high flows that are sort of off the trend of everything else, but uh, our stream base flow estimates in blue here uh, ranging around 400 CFS, and here's the red, the simulated model doing the same thing. Uh, this will be for the North Loop River near St. Paul, Nebraska. And again, here you see some temporal trend as well, you know, again, in the blue dots as well as in the red dots, the model's reproducing those sort of regional water level patterns. This is a little bit shorter record. It only goes from 1940 to 1978. Uh, but, it, and this one has some noise in it. This is uh, at the range of about 2,000 CFS is where we start here. Um, but again, you know, you see the regional model capturing the big picture of what those estimated stream base flows are telling us. Uh, the North Platte River at North Platte, this one has a variety of other flows, you know, up and down mixed into it. But again, you see the model reproducing, um, reproducing these trends as we go through the, the record. 
um, and a little bit better later on even. Um, and then Stinking Water Creek near Palisade, just show you one of the Republican tributaries. Um, and again, we see a trend. This is a smaller stream, but starting around 40 or so CFS estimated and simulated stream base flow and declining uh, to around 10 to 20 CFS stream base flow. So our analysis of future water availability that we are going to do here shortly, um, we have estimates of future land use patterns. I'll tell you more about it in a minute. Um, we're going to use climate data, this downscaled IPCC data, um, <clears throat> along, and so those two pieces of data with the daily soil water balance model we used for the calibration period model, um, we can be used to generate a new estimates of recharge and pumpage for these future time periods. We'll compare a, a sort of a baseline future against what happens under these various land use projections and say, you know, what is the difference between the future under those various conditions? How does that impact our future stream flows and groundwater levels in the aquifer? Um, just to mention about this future land use model, uh, Terry Soul, one of our colleagues at Eros in South Dakota, had generated this. This paper is from 2012, and if anybody wants to know, I can send you the link to it. But um, basically, he's expanded this technique now, and it's going to be published pretty soon for the entire United States. Um, and so, you know, these are land use projections. He now uh, is able to produce continuous land use pro projections from a, something like 1940 to the year 2100 for various scenarios. And so you have continuous and consistent data across that range of times. Uh, oops, I think I went one too many there previous. So here's an example for one particular scenario of what some of that land use data looks like. 2012 shown on the left, 2050 on the right. Uh, what you see is agricultural land class shown in yellow, expanding during that time. And you can see particularly up in this area that brown is actually uh, sort of rangeland, grassland, that kind of thing. And that's uh, it replaced in part by this yellow of agricultural expansion in this particular scenario. And this is not to say that's what's going to happen, but if you have a scenario, you can generate this new recharge pumpage and model outputs then that say, if that scenario of land use is correct, you know, here's what kind of outputs you would get. Um, here's a different example you can see in this one, this is for further east in the area, um, in 2012, much more irrigated agriculture, but you can also see expansion of urban lands, which are shown in red. Um, you can see this purple color is actually uh, various kinds of wetlands. And you can see some of that going away in the western portion of this. Here's expansion of Grand Island. You know, so there's various things uh, that come from this. In summary, what this looks like mainly is uh, an expansion of agriculture at the expense of grassland and, and rangeland. Um, these uh, particular estimates are not tied in with what we now know is going on in Nebraska in some areas with the limitation of expansion of new acres. but. These are, you know, you know, potential estimates that, that are out there. Um, so the published model, when it comes out, and those analyses are really just the start. I mean, well, this model is meant to be a tool for everybody across the northern high plains for future and continued analysis. It's not just the model. It's also the data and things that we put together and are publishing as part of the study. Um, the model is suitable for regional questions that could be asked across many sub-areas in the northern high plains, or it certainly is suitable as a jumping off point for new modeling or more detailed modeling of sub-areas of the northern high plains. Um, a possible area for future development, I've talked about before, and some of you have heard me talk about fully coupled landscape and groundwater flow modeling. And that's something that we developed a prototype of as part of this study, uh, but there's a room for additional work uh, on the prototype on this sort of approach. Um, it gives you the ability, if you go in that direction then, to have uh, better forecast the availability of surface water for irrigation in the future, uh, irrigation delivery trade-offs, uh, more efficient forecasting the effects of land use or other water resource management decision changes, uh, as well as Characterization of co-mangled irrigated agriculture, which in some areas is kind of a big unknown and um, hardly measured. Just to say, you know, what I've shown you so far today about our soil water balance model and the groundwater flow model is they are sequentially coupled models. First, you have a landscape model that, that estimates this recharge. It takes in land use or climate data. 
um, feeds it into this soil water balance model that knows nothing about groundwater or it's where it's at and outputs this estimated recharge and irrigation withdrawals which then feed into the groundwater flow model along with stream and aquifer data to produce our simulated water budgets, uh, water levels, and stream flows. Um, to use a, a, another approach would be to fully couple that landscape model together with the groundwater flow model so that those feedbacks and trade-offs that we really know occur can happen in, as part of the simulation. This ModFlow OM, which uh, has recently been published, um, you can think of this like ModFlow Plus. Um, we have the integrated hydrologic and land use models coupled together. Um, the guys who wrote this like to say it's all the water, all the time, everywhere. And so rather than taking these large components of the water balance that I showed you earlier, uh, 192 million acre feet of precipitation that's occurring and say, well, we're only going to worry about this you know, very small percentage that becomes recharged, you actually deal with that entire uh, amount of water and apportion it to all the places correctly. Um, it couples those hydrologic processes and flows. It has uh, built-in functionality for irrigation, demand, uh, and availability, and then farm-by-farm -farm accounting. And farms mean water balance regions. Um, and so here's just a schematic of all the various things that can be incorporated then. Mod flow would be this section down here below the water table, the regular mod flow. But you couple all these landscape processes directly with the groundwater flow simulation. And so, oops, I should just go back quickly and say, um, rather than the two separate models sequentially coupled together, here we have all that raw uh, available data for land use and things coupled together with the groundwater flow simulation. Much greater amount of outputs and information you can get from that. Um, so just to wrap up, an important agricultural and groundwater resource for our nation in the High Plains. And these subregions are very different from each other. The hydrogeology and processes, you know, which uh, covered more in Jesse's talk, and there's a lot of those detailed things, though, uh, even north to the south and that climate and these various things drive the stream flow of management, uh, the groundwater resource. And, um, and so uh, this study is meant to be, you know, providing additional information for us to use. So uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. Sure. Um, you know, I guess it depends upon the particular question that uh, needed to be asked, but the model, uh, when the final report comes out, it will contain information about under these scenarios uh, what kind of changes in stream-based flows or simulated water levels would result from that. However, uh, these are just a few scenarios. It's meant to just be a sampling. And so if a particular natural resources district wanted to know about some specific future scenario um, that had to do, you know, specified by, they wanted to say, well, there's going to be 5% of irrigation increase in this area or, you know, those kind of things, those specific, specific analysis, um, you know, that's what you could use this model for is delving into questions uh, about those future forecasts that are different than what we'll present. So uh, certainly it also could be used for, uh, again, um, you know, we've just focused on if land use has changed or if, uh, you know, uh, climate changed, if a particular NRD had other questions about, you know, what if uh, they changed to a more efficient pattern of irrigation? Uh, you went from, you know, uh, sprinklers to sub-irrigation through, you know, uh, drip lines or whatever it might be. We have the capability of doing many different kinds of analyses with this tool, so. Well, let's give our three speakers, Steve and Don and Jesse, a hand.